All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Danilevich. I am the Associate Director of Web and Application Services for the Division of Finance, IT Services at the University of Pennsylvania. And we also cover a little bit of data there. So um, we run a portfolio of a number of uh, websites. And one of the things that people are looking at today are there's a lot of interest in data. You know, how does my website perform? So what I've done is, uh, you know, me and my team, we've looked at, we've been using what was Google Data Studio, but is now referred to as Looker. Uh, they've recently rebranded it, uh, and that's what we use for some dashboarding analytics. So the common issue that you'll get is you manage a website or a portfolio website for your stakeholders, and obviously they want to see some performance measures. So um, how do you think you would do that? Well, the range today seems to be dashboards. Everybody wants to know about dashboards. Upper management likes dashboards. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is they know you run Google Analytics on your site. So what's the first thing your stakeholders say? I want access to Google Analytics. You can do that. But what's the problem with that? There's so much data in Google Analytics that now you're probably going to have more questions than data. Well, you're, you're going to have the data, but you know, it's not curated data. That data is going to be uh, all over the place. You got to kind of set it up for people. You got to hold their hands. So now you're going to probably have more questions and you're going to spend more time. So you got to kind of figure out what's the happy median. Where's the, uh, where, where can I get that data? And what can I present to my shareholders? So I don't have to spend the time to give it to them. Dashboards are the rage now. Well, you want things presented in one handy dandy place. Uh, where can you do that? Obviously a dashboard. So that means curating that data. You're using Google Analytics, you can prepare reports in there. You can do your custom reports and then you can obviously email them on a regular basis. But it's a nice snapshot. But keep in mind that, that report that you're emailing is just a static snapshot in time. It doesn't give the person the flexibility to go back in time or, or change the parameters to give them a good accurate picture uh, when they're going back and forth and slicing and dicing that data. So just what is a, da a, a data dashboard? A data dashboard, by definition, is going to be a tool providing a centralized interactive means of reporting, measuring, analyzing insights from data of key elements in key areas in an interactive, intuitive, and visual way. And in other words, curating it and, and getting that data in front of the person. Some of the tools that you can use to create these dashboards are Microsoft Power BI, Tableau Public, Good Data, Databox, Kumu, Vizlo, Vizme, PicnicChart, more. Uh, Smartsheet. Smartsheet's another thing where you can put in data in Smartsheet and then give yourself a, a dashboard. It has capability to do a dashboard, but that's kind of a, a process too because you have the underlying data, then you have to create a summary sheet, and then you have to create that dashboard. It's interactive, but still, uh, there's a, a process in doing that. Decisions, decisions. That's where you now enter with what's now called Looker. It used to be called Data Studio. Uh, your data is it's beautiful. Use it. And the great thing is, it's free. You just go out there. If you have a Google account, and you probably have a Google account already because you've got your Google tracking code, you've signed up for that. Being a Google product makes it a natural choice for working directly with Google Analytics. Dashboards with Looker Studio are going to contain two main components. And that's one, a data source. And you want to connect to your data source, that's 
what it, exactly what it says. It's a source of data. So you have to have the underlying data first. And then the second part is reports. And that's where you create your visualizations. And again, a dashboard is being a visualization. Key data sources, when you go into Looker Studio or, or Data Studio, as I'll probably fall back and you know, call it Google Data Studio a couple times, but when you go there and you go into that overview and then you say you want to connect to your data and you look for your data source that you want to look, uh, connect to. Right there at the top, Google Analytics, Google Ads, Google Sheets, BigQuery. These are all data sources that Google can pull in. Uh, if you can look up there, there are Looker Studio connections, there's 21. I did snap this the other day, so that's the accurate total for now, but there's 21. Um, that's not all 21 there, obviously, but um, it's a good representative sample of uh, what you can connect to. So Google Sheets, uh, one of the bit ones that is not listed there, but is good, and you'll probably want to use as part of your dashboard is your search console. You can also connect to the data from Google Search Console, which will provide you with some good insights. You can also get partner or third-party connectors. As of this clip the other day, 730 of them, most of them for a fee. Uh, full list of connectors, if you go to lookerstudio.google.com slash data, which is where this comes from, you'll be able to see what those connectors are. Uh, another thing we use is uh, we use the Fresh, Freshworks suite of products. There is a connector in there, so if you're running Freshworks, Fresh Desk for your service, uh, any type of operational things there, uh, Fresh Desk being your ticketing system, you can actually pull, they have a connector, and we've connected that, and I'll show you a little later there, that you know, we get some basic trends out of there. You're not going to get full data. Uh, you you kind of got to massage it a little bit, but you'll get good highlight data from something like a, uh, a fresh desk. Your key report components that you have. And again, these are where you're going to visualize your data, and they call them charts. Uh, just for comparison, like Freshworks. Freshworks has an analytics. They've, they've upgraded their reporting to what they call analytics now. They call them widgets. Some places, uh, some products, when they have these charts, they're going to refer to them as widgets. Pretty much an interchangeable term, but uh, that's your key to visualizations. And these are things like bar charts. So you can have a basic bar chart. You can have the stack bar chart. You can turn the orientation on them. Uh, you can make it a little bit you know, based on preference, based on what you want to bring highlighting to that data. Uh, you can change that orientation. The line chart, and you can use that as a combination with a combination of line and bar chart, again with a stacked bar chart, as well as just lines themselves to compare and contrast. Time series. So now you can track your data over time. Again, uh, very effective. This is things like total users, uh, new users, page views, things like that. Because they're spread over time, you can represent them in a time series. Pie charts are big. You can take your data, you have the regular pie chart. Again, preference here. Whatever your preference is, if you want to represent it as a donut chart with the open center, you can do that. Uh, you can control your labels, which we'll get into a little bit later. Area charts. Again, the nice nifty line chart, but with an area, so it's shaded in. Table data. This is a, a real good uh, tool when you're looking to show multiple points of data and you have different uh, dimensions, you can put them in a table. Pivot table. Pivot tables are also all, uh, very popular now. You can represent your data as a pivot table. Scorecard. When you want to bring the highlight to a, a 
definitive number, you know, for a period of time, total, total hits, total sessions. The scorecard makes it nice and concise, puts it in one place, very effective. The gauge, the gauge is a nice little tool that if you do want to use something like the scorecard number, but you want to show it relative to some other data, you can pick a range. That way you're kind of showing where you are in your desired range and where your results fall. So that is another nice little visualization that's effective. The, scat, uh, the scatter, you can, or I say splatter sometimes, you can splatter your data uh, with representative points there. Again, uh, you know, you're going to have an x-axis, a y-axis, and where that data falls, you can see the bullet. The bullet's kind of a combination of a gauge and a table. And, you know, again, a preference there. The Google map, if you're tracking, say, page hits or users from different geographical areas, Something like, um, you know, you want to track product sales, things like that. And you want to know by geographical area what, what, what campaigns are effective. They're going to be nice to see on a Google map. A geo chart, pretty much the same deal. Uh, it's just showing your results in a geographic area. And a tree map. Um, that is kind of almost like a heat map too. Uh, it'll show you different proportions and proportion your data in different areas. Controls. Controls are effective because what they're going to do is they're going to add the ability to change the data of the visualization. Again, the purpose of having a dashboard was the interactiveness. And that's where the controls come into effect. Think of chart controls, chart or widget. These controls will apply to a specific chart that you have. So if you want, it's used for data filtering. So you could do a drop down list. So when you know that your data has multiple ways to view it, you can incorporate a drop down list. You could do the fixed size list. You could do an input box. You could do the advanced filter, which is a nice filter because that way uh, you can filter out your data based on relative terms. The slider, um, it's just a, a kind of a different representation of a drop down or fixed size list. And a checkbox. So all your possible filters for your data would be in an area and you would just check the ones that you want to see. At the report level control, a report level control, think of the big picture. You're going to have a series of charts there which you can filter uh, in your visualization, in your report, but the report level controls, what they do is they'll change everything um, when you cross filter there. And that most commonly is a date range control and a data control. And that's the data source. So you can actually, if you had multiple websites and you created a dashboard, and rather than recreate it again, you can just switch the data control and control the data that's going into that report at the report level. Sharing reports. Obviously, you create this report, you're really proud, you want to take it to your boss, you want to take it to the stakeholders. How do you share these reports? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to remember how you invite people. Because the most frustrating thing about working with this is that by default, it's going to be off. And it's only going to say only the specific people that can access it, which you grant. But uh, when, you, when you create these visualizations, if you're going to later embed them, say you want to embed them in a web, pa web page for uh, access, you check anyone on the internet can find and view. If you want somebody that wants to edit it, you can, you can change that. You can make an edit. You can have anyone with the link. You can send out the link. So that's kind of a little more refined. It's not on the, the internet. It's not out in public. You can just basically invite people via link, and they can either view or edit. 
Schedule an email. Again, uh, kind of defeats the purpose because that way it won't be interactive because that report will go out to the person uh, that you put in the email. You can get the report link, which we said you can control the access there. As I said, embed the report, which is really popular if you're going to do the um, embedding in a, a page. And basically, when you check that option, you'll see how that wants to embed. You can say you want to enable embedding. You can either embed the code or embed the URL. Keep in mind, the URL will take you to the actual Visual Studio or Looker Studio. But what happens there is then the access applies above. So if the person is not on the invite list or you say, hey, anybody with a link can view it, uh, they're going to be right in the report as opposed to embedding the code in a page, you can control uh, the setup a little bit better there. And you can download the report as PDF. What if the data is not there? Oh, this is a good one because if you work with Google Analytics, for the longest time you worked under UA which was Universal Analytics. When this was prepared, uh, and when, when we first started this journey, that's what we were working with. Then Google came by and said, we have a new thing, we have GA4. That's the new tracking code. Plus, we're gonna make it, we're just gonna make it required as of July 1st, 2023. So if you don't have a GA4 code, you wanna, you wanna get that now. The good thing was Universal used to dump a lot of data out there and you'd have things that you wanted and they were kind of easy to find. GA4 changed the whole, whole face of things and they turned around and they made it more event based. So some of the things that you used to see that were kind of easy to get to via URLs, some, some things like especially if you're dealing with digital products, you want to look at like PDF downloads or report downloads, these things are there in GA4, but they're a little harder to get to. And that's where you have to kind of now massage your data. And if it's not there, you got to make it up. So in our case, what we want to see was, we want to see the email links that were clicked. We want to see what files were downloaded because we provide a lot of information that people are downloading. So that's very key to us. Some of the things we also want to see is the outbound URL for outbound referrals. We want to see where we're referring from our site to other sites. Uh, so the shortcut to this, I couldn't take in analytics to see this because the tracking code is there. So what I did was I screenshotted it. Uh, and you can find this pretty easy if you search GA4 custom definitions. So what you do is you just go in there and go under admin scroll down to where it says custom definitions there and then click the create custom definition and then what it'll do is it'll say it basically guides you and it guides you pretty well it'll say what's the scope and most likely because now everything is event based you want to look at that event and then just say hey uh, when you click on event it'll give you some of the uh, what they call uh, attributes and they'll expose the attributes and you just look down there and you'll see it. it'll say email link and you just click the email and it creates that custom definition. Once you create that and save it, what will happen is now Google will, GA4 will do the tracking for you. So up until the point you, uh, up until the point you create this, you will not have data. But after you create it, then your data will start to appear in your analytics uh, by default. So if we're going to put this all together. And I'm going to give you a little case study here and show you what these web properties look like in a live demo. Because you can talk about it, but when you see it live, it makes a little more sense. So as we said, there's two things here. Uh, when you go into Looker Studio, it basically looks like a Google product. You have your reports and your data sources. Here, I've set up a, a data source based on our GA4 results for our finance site. And when you open that up, everything that's in GA4 is here. And there's two things. When you're, when you're dealing with uh, analytics, there's two things that you have to remember. And this is how I remember them. There's dimensions and there's metrics. Because everybody, stakeholders will say, 
I need metrics. I want to see metrics. Metrics, the M, is a measurement. You measure it somehow. Users, page views, hits. Those metrics and measures are described, D, by dimensions. The dimensions, so you now, if you look and you see their city, and we talked about how you can take your results and you can look by a geographical area if you want to see that, a city, a country. That describes those user hits. How many hits per day in a city? So the city is the dimension. If you scroll down here, uh, GA4 gives you not, I believe, under universal. These dimensions used to be about 130. They're now 90. Um, and if you look here, if you scroll down and see where it says email links there now, it says an event was scoped custom dimension for your analytics property. It confirms the fact that we created that custom dimension and it's now being captured. Same thing with file downloads there. So there's your dimensions that describe your data. And here are your, if you look here, the blue is the metrics. And it could be one day active users, add to carts, checkouts, conversions, event revenue, event value, events per session. What it'll eventually look like, so when you take your report and you incorporate some of these things that we talked about, the scorecard, the time series, they'll look something like this. And all of this can be customized. You can customize by color, you can customize by uh, formats here. When we look at the edits, and you look here, and you click on something here, and there's that, the chart, or score, uh, a chart, and the chart is, the style is, um, it's, a, it's a scorecard. And the here, you just pull over your metric. So what we're measuring here is the views. And by default, it's going to go with the comparison date range of, that we put at the report level, which is, this is that control again. This is a report level control. And you can fully customize this with your style. So you can pick things like uh, whether you want your comparisons here. You can show your absolute change. So I could show an absolute change. I can go in here. I can check if it's decimal based. You can do a decimal. Your labels. Um, there's the big number. Uh, there's one thing here that says you can control your formatting of your number. So if you didn't want to show it as 33,000, oh, compact numbers, primary metric, you don't want that to say 33,000, you can simply check and say compact numbers, and now it changes it to 33.7 instead of giving you the absolute number. Uh, you can hide your comparison label here. The, the comparison label is what you will see. Uh, it will say your views are down by that percent there. You can hide that if you want. You can take that off, you can say, oh, it's the label. So there is, a, it, by default, it will give you the change, but you can hide the label. So, time series here. This is a time series. Uh, your setup, you can change your setup here. Your dimension, the dimension which describes date is by date. And you can see at the bottom here, it runs from the period of February 17th to March 16th, which was yesterday, and it shows your users. Some of the things here, like key user trends, you can see um, that the, the trends are here. And that basically shows you that a lot of people were still kind of on vacation in February. Uh, so the user base has, has increased. And it, not only do you see it on the time series, but you can also see it in the total users here and total user metrics that were up by a representative percentage there. The actual live dashboard, that's a demo that's within Data Studio, but there's some things that I also want to point out here. Uh, we can look here, and if this is where it makes it interactive, it makes it a little more meaningful for the end user, the stakeholder. Say they wanted to look at um, this quarter, this quarter, let's say this quarter, because I want to point out something there. So this quarter, 
basically says, okay, this quarter is going to run from January 1st to March 31st. We apply it. And I'm hoping my wireless capability here is good, and it is. And the nice thing about this is, well, there's a little bit of incomplete data here, and that is because we haven't hit the end of the quarter yet. We still have two days or two weeks left, and you can see there that the trend line for the current period ends on March 16th. It doesn't go out to the quarter. Same thing here with the total users. Again, ends at the 16th and not at the end there for the representative uh, time frame. How do you say, well, I want something a little more accurate than that? You go back here, you just say, I want to look at the quarter to date. So now it'll take the actual time period from January 1st to March 16th and look at the same representative time period again. And because these are embedded, they have to go out there, they have to exchange the information. But again, it is interactive, totally. Uh, you could do this for the year. So then, it, I don't want to do that because it's too much data, but you'll see it would go from January, if you said, for a whole year, you could go back to, say we want to go from March 1st of last year to March 1st of this year, it would draw this out. So again, you can see your trends there. Uh, one of the other things I want to show here is page views. Again, a time series. If you look at the time series report, and here, this is the total page views and trends for the Division of Finance for the period of the last month. One of the neat things you can do in here um, is that, see this percentage of views? You can calculate this. And what's nice is you can calculate that as representative of the data that you're displaying. What that means is if I go in here, and this is one of those things, the filter, uh, where I said, you have a filter where you can do the advanced filter. Right here, you say page title. I want to look at title, page titles that contain path, or tax, I'm sorry. Now we get only the page results that had tax in the URL for the page title. So you can see that some of the query strings, some of the things that people are searching for, being that it's the Division of Finance, it's tax season, People are looking for tax withhold changing. That's two results. And again, we talked about how you can change your visualization or here the percentage of views. Well, if you look down here, there is 20 views of all page titles that contain tax, which is a, represents 100%. But a nice little handy math there. If you look at the next result down, it's two. Two of 20 is what? 10%. So it recalculated that percentage. So you can bring that meaningful data back to your users there. Uh, again, we could see that you know, tax time is pretty popular. We can go back here and say, well, what about the first of the year? Because we know that we see that right here, and I'm going to kind of bet that that's 1099s. People are looking for their 1099s at the end of the year um, for vendors, vendors that have tax, tax things there. That also, I mentioned uh, search. You could do this for your search terms on your site. And if we're looking for search terms here, tax template is very popular. Uh, these are the search terms that are on your internal search. And that's differentiated from what I called Google search or search terms that are searched on Google, which then come into the site. So these people are already on the site. They use your search capability, and that's what they're looking for. That's the search terms they're looking for. Uh, if we go over to Google search here, this is the external. This is somebody going to Google. This is somebody saying, what do I want to look for? Um, there's another little nifty feature you can do with something like a table. If you notice, it says highlight click through uh, click through rates for anything that's higher than 75%. That's uh, what you call highlighting, conditional formatting. You can go in there and you set it in part of that style. You say, I want to conditionally format anything where that site CTR click through rate is higher than 75%. And that's what it does. It, it brings that out for you. It, it highlights 
certain results. Uh, again, here, uh, people are looking externally for the W-2. And if I go over to January 1st, we get an idea here again that 1099 miscellaneous. So what's interesting here, too, is you, you can see your average position. In this case, we decide to pull average position back. Um, and that's the average position of where you're going to find these results in um, in the Google results. So if I were to go out and do a Google search right now and look and put in 1099 miscellaneous, it's going to tell me it generated 67,000 impressions for people and the average position, if you go out there and Google that, the pen result for 1099 miscellaneous is going to be about the ninth position, somewhere around nine. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of content that is Penified or pen specific. Uh, ben Financial's U Pen comes in at 1.04. Uh, a pen, U Pen W2, is coming in at number one. Uh, foreign National Information System, um, and that has a street, pretty strong position, even though the click through rate is only 40, uh, but it's positioned at the top. So object codes are. Most, we have links for the object codes there, but then again, here's that query uh, and it says contains. So if I were looking for a specific keyword search term or anything like that, I could go in there and do a filter for that. Uh, one of the interesting things that I saw in prepping for this was, I think it fell off, didn't it? There was something about the taxability of alcohol and I was, pretty surprised that the average position was pretty high on that because people are always asking, you know, hey, if I go to, I put a travel voucher in and I put alcohol on that bill, uh, is it going to be reimbursed? Well, the taxability of that is, you know, it, it won't, you know, people are always concerned with that So uh, when they turn in their expense report. So we have content that caters to that, but it's interesting that that always comes to the top. And uh, one of the other things, the events, that's, so downloads, referrals, so like I said, uh, we have a lot of content that has, that we're specific to, uh, we want to see where people are downloading our content, so we created that file download, the custom dimension to track this, so now the custom dimension by the name of file download is pulled, and you can see the GL object codes when people are you know, charging things against the budget, GL object codes, well, they're downloading this at a, a pretty reasonable pace here. Uh, another thing that seems to be popular is the fiscal 22 annual report. It's 7% of the results that came through. Uh, city wage tax refund, that's for people who are working outside the city. Uh, so it's tax time. You'll see that number six on the, the file downloads for this time period is, you know, that wage tax relief form. People want to know that, hey, I've worked outside the city. Um, I'm being charged city wage tax. I want my refund. So they're looking for that particular document. Interesting enough is the payment status inquiry form, which is a, a worksheet that has to be uh, for, this is for vendors who are looking for their payment status in our Ben Financial system. Um, so they're looking for that, they're downloading that payment inquiry form. There's a, a required worksheet that they have to fill out when submitting that request. So we know that a lot of vendors are submitting that information. They need that as a supplement to their submission. So therefore, uh, that is coming there. Tax withholding on graduate stipends, it's a PDF people to fill out. Again, tax time, it's raising that to the, the top. Um, referrals, where are we referring out? What links on our site are going out to other uh, entities, on, either on campus or externally? And um, that is the login for the Ben Help system. That is the Ben Help support system. So people have questions with the Ben Helps uh, particular application and they need to, to find something that is the, the uh, link that so they come to our site and they click out 
you'll see that there's probably a lot of other things uh, over to the workday system, uh, the human resources system. People are coming there. They can't find the question, and the question refers them to workday. It says, hey, you've got to contact. Uh, that answer should be found at workday, so it's a click. Uh, one of the little things there, real quick, is that we're showing as the referrals. We, as you saw in the custom definitions, there was the outbound referrals, which were URLs. There was the mailing, uh, the, the, you know, links that are on there that say mail to a particular person, or actually a telephone number too. We, we have some links as a telephone number. But 97 are, are clicks, outbound referrals. And again, the cross filtering for a report, if I were to click that little mail to, it would show us, you know, what these mail results are. And these are the people that these links were clicked. So when you see that link to initiate an email to a person, uh, these are the people that are being emailed to. And with that, we have about five minutes. And basically, if you have any questions, I'll field any questions. But I hope that in inspires you to you know, use that free product to build those dashboards for your stakeholders and, and let them see their data real time. But uh, it takes them getting used to. Um, just, it's a drop and drag system. I really didn't show how easy it is, but basically you, you pick that chart, you drag the chart, uh, you, you bring it over to the, the, I guess you would call it the drawing board. It's by default, when you click a report, it gives you a table. Uh, basic table and it'll throw some, it'll throw a dimension in there and it'll throw a metric in there. And then from there, you can add multiple uh, metrics. Uh, you can create custom metrics. So if we look at page views and trends again, over here, if I were to edit this, uh, I'm not in edit mode here, but what you'll see is by the, well, yeah, there, there is multiple. So there's, uh, this is your metric, your metric is your views, but your two different dimensions or definitions of the data are page title and page path. And we did that for a reason because the page title is, that's what you see in English, and the page path is the more uh, technical, the path to the actual content, the node in Drupal. Um, oh, that's another thing I can kind of go over, and I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a bummer, but to just let you know that, uh, see these sites here, there are a couple of Drupal sites there. I know it's Drupal Cam. There are some Drupal sites here. There are some WordPress sites here. And there is even a static HTML site there. So the results, if I were to go into the dashboard here, and I'll pick the one that I know is a static site, page views and trends, my dashboard looks exactly the same for the static site as it did for the WordPress site. If I go to the Drupal site, it'll all look the same. So as long as you're running your Google Analytics and you have your valid tracking code in Drupal, in your, in your module, you have your module, you have your tracking code. If you're in WordPress and you're using a plugin that tracks Google Analytics, if you're using Google Tag Manager on a static site, the data is there. It's the same process over and over again. So. You can, everything looks consistent. Yes? Um, I've been using uh, uh, Google uh, Studio, uh, Data Studio for a while. One of the main issues that I had was uh, filtering out spam and uh, referral spam and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and then I guess uh, from the Google Data Studio to the Looker, is there any real difference or it's just uh, it's just a branding. The, the, question, the question is, is there any difference between Google Data Studio and Looker? That portion of the question, and that is no. There is, there is no uh, difference. There, it's just branding. It's just the data connection that you want to you know, make sure is correct. The other thing with uh, mentioning filtering out spam. There is a capability here. Uh, I noticed that we went to when we went to GA4. If you're looking at like page hits and there's some things that you find questionable for spam, 
Right here down at the bottom, see where it says time series filter? You have to create a filter because um, especially in that the downloads and referrals, what was happening was because GA4 is event driven, all those events flow through. So you see the click, the page, what's it, the page scroll, where it says it scrolls the page, things like that. So what we had to do was we had to create a filter and say, I only want to include the field under these conditions. So that helps, that could help you filter some of that out. So you've got to just figure out what that field is that's affected and then how you want to approach filtering it out. So it does take some trial and error, but that's my suggestion is what you want to do is you want to go in there and look at the filter on your, your chart for your visualization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the sessions. Thank you.